I believe that every good story is a love story. And all of us are here because we speak about things we love or we speak because the things we love are threatened. All of our stories, however, begin with water. And all of our stories begin with a swimmer. Yes. My story began 33 years ago, and my swimmer had to swim for a long time until I got back into the water. I was born outside Johannesburg, and I grew up on a horse farm. And people often ask me whether the dams were very deep, and they weren't. But there were lots of rivers, and I realized early that I was only happy if I was in the water. I grew up with my sister, and we believed that we were mermaids. And we had a mermaid language that we could only speak underwater. And we would make these weird little squeaking and squawking sounds that I thought were so unique when we were small. But I've realized that they're actually very similar to what dolphins and whales do. And I moved to Sweden because I thought I wanted to do something different with my life to what I am doing with my life. And lucky for me, I met somebody who took me back into the water. And I got to learn what freediving is. And I realized freediving is exactly what I was dreaming about as a child. Freediving is living the mermaid dream. And don't tell me, there's not a single one of you girls here who has not dreamt of being a mermaid. <laughs> it's true. So I dive with the monofin and go as deep as I can on one breath. Freediving is about di diving as deep, as far, or as long as possible on one single breath of air. And people often ask whether it's safe, <laughs> how deep I can go, and how long I can hold my breath. And those questions in varying orders are important. Um, firstly, I think it's safer than many other things I do, for example, driving my car. <laughs> and I can dive to 65 meters on one breath, and I can hold my breath for six minutes. <laughs> and that's not even the best in the world. And I'm telling you that not to impress you, I'm telling you that to inspire you. Because what I want to share with you is how your body is adapted to doing this. Your body remembers that little swimmer that's still swimming, that still wants to swim and wants you to step back into water. So this image is from Egypt, where I've done my deepest dives in very blue water. And I start my dive with a few powerful kicks to leave the area of buoyancy. When we buoyant, we float. I get to a point of neutral buoyancy, and then I start dropping. This is called the free fall. This is my most favorite part of every dive and my most favorite part of my life. When I feel gravity, flotation, everything disappear, I close my eyes, and I drop. And I allow the ocean to take me. And as I fall, I start falling faster and faster. And all I have to remember is that I'm born to do this, my body knows what it's doing, and I need to trust it. Trust for me is a very interesting thing. We speak about finding somebody we can trust. We speak about when our trust is broken. We speak about trust as if it's something outside of ourselves. The most difficult thing I have learned is to trust myself, is to trust what my body can do in water. When we dive, our body remembers Somewhere in our past, we have spent time in water, and we have the same adaptations that seals and whales and dolphins have for deep diving. I always say that seals are our cousins and dolphins are our friends. They re our bodies remember that we share this knowledge. And what happens in me, in you, if you were to try this, which I definitely recommend you do, the first thing that happens is your face touches the water is that your heart rate slows down a lot, and it gets ready for conserving oxygen. Second thing that happens as you start diving, blood starts getting flushed back from your arms and your legs to your heart to be pumped to your brain. You don't need perfectly oxygenated hands and feet when you're diving. And then your spleen suddenly, magnificently has a purpose. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many of you have ever thought of your spleen. After today, you will guard it with your life. Your spleen is valuable, people. Don't let anybody ever take it away from you. As you dive, I heard somebody say, watch your spleen. Your spleen <laughs> is situated round about here, and it's about that size, and it is more or less 
a sponge. And this sponge is full of oxygen-rich hemoglobin. And as you dive, as your body remembers, I'm diving. I remember diving. Wait, I need to do something. Yes, this is what I'm going to do. It contracts and it squirts out that red blood cells, that rich hemoglobin full of oxygen into your bloodstream. And you carry on diving. It's like blood doping, except it's legal and <laughs> we do it all the time. Okay, so now my spleen's contracted, my blood shifted, my heart rate slowed down. And as I dive, my lungs get compressed. And early freedivers were told by researchers that if we go deeper than 50 meters, we'll die. The reason why researchers believed this is because air in water gets compressed and your lungs become compressed. And if you imagine your lungs becoming compressed, at some point something will have to give, they thought. But that's underestimating your body. That's not trusting the dive response. What happens is blood shifts into the membranes around the alveoli in the lungs and cushions it so that it can get completely compressed as you dive down to greater and greater depths. So each and every one of you has a little seal living inside of you, wondering when you are going to step back into water. Don't keep it waiting too long. So as I realized this about my body, and as I realized that this is the place that makes me happiest, and that this is my love story, that this is where I want to be living, I started traveling to experience what I call our last wilderness, our great blue, the blue that we see from space that is our planet. We've heard such amazing statistics about how little of it has been explored. From the smallest to the greatest, we know so little. What I do know is that I carry that water in me. We carry that knowledge of diving in us. We are representations of the ocean. We are part of that system. Don't believe you're separate from it. And I see that with people who can't even swim, that sit on the beach and love to stare. And they say to me, I'm not a swimmer, but I love staring at the ocean. If you're an ocean gazer or if you're an ocean explorer, you've got that in you. So this is in Egypt, diving with turtles. And my whole dream now is to meet these creatures that inhabit our last wilderness and to share space with them, to share the blue with them, to share moments with them. And this turtle found me fascinating. I don't know why, because turtles always seem so unbelievably self-possessed and they're so on their own little journey. You know, they, I don't know if you've looked into the eye of a turtle, but they seem like they know something that you don't know and they're very busy achieving it. <laughs> um, whale sharks are different. This is in the Maldives. And Whale sharks are so gentle, and sometimes they seem curious, and they kind of accept your presence. And um, they're just so unbelievably beautiful. I mean, when you swim down to a whale shark and you see that broad back opening in front of you, it's as if you're staring up into a starry sky. It's the most phenomenal experience. They really, really are special. Manta rays are <laughs> breathtaking, which as a free diver is an occupational hazard. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I saw a manta ray, I really felt as if this is it. I don't have to see anything else ever again. The elegance, the grace, the beauty of these creatures blew my mind. And they're so large and so aware of where I am in the water. I mean, they would be swimming close. And I mean, I'm not half as agile in the water as they are. And if I happen to be in one's path as it's coming, it would just gently lift its wing and pass by. Not, as, not creating any vortex, no flow, no nothing, just passing by. This one, I was floating up and the manta ray slowed down and I felt this touch on me and it was a very happy moment. <laughs> right, so Linda mentioned this was last week. And I am incredibly fascinated with the mammals in our ocean. I mean, they are phenomenal. And I've dived a lot with dolphins. And I'm very, very, very much in love with sharks. I do want to say that, even though they're not featuring here today. Sharks are terribly misunderstood. It's very easy to love a whale and to love a seal and love a dolphin. But a shark, you need to know. You really need to know them. And I've gotten to know them, and I love them deeply. They are terribly misunderstood. And I've spent a lot of time with sharks in the last couple of years. 
And I've had this itching inside of me to get back to my inner mammal, to get back to the mammal. And I got the opportunity a few weeks ago to go to Sri Lanka and to meet this, the greatest of all mammals. And if you see the perspective, I'm a bit away from the whale. The photographer's a bit away from us. It's a very large creature and probably the most gentle, gentle creature I've encountered in the ocean. That whale knew exactly where I was. She was coming straight towards us and I was waiting in front and she dived and slowed down just like this. So I had my timing right to come with her. And it was almost like she was waiting and going, what, you're not coming with me all the way? I was like, no, I can't, you go, go. <laughs> it was phenomenal, incredibly, really, really the gentle giants. In this place where we went to meet the, the blue whales, I had to have the great privilege, it was phenomenal, to meet sperm whales. And sperm whales, uh, another creature with a bad reputation, people say, but aren't they dangerous? They do have very large teeth. They're the largest toothed whale. Um, again, unbelievably gentle. They are the story of Moby Dick, as you know, which I tried not to think of as we headed out to meet them. And sperm whales, being toothed whales, being more predators than baleen whales are so intelligent and there's this communication going on the whole time while you're in the water and it almost feels like you know sometimes they're talking about the squid they're about to go eat and sometimes it feels like they're gossiping, uh, gossiping about you because you would have these larger groups of whales and the way we dive with them is waiting for them to approach us and as they approach one would inevitably turn its head and start scanning now, I must be honest, there is nothing more heart-opening than being scanned by a whale. It's this tick, 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 that gets louder and louder as it gets closer. And you can tell the difference between the ones that are kind of having the general conversation and the one that's really checking you out. Because it kind of lifts its head to get more, um, the, the, the scanning to be like, stronger above the water and then adopt dips it again and then up and down and I feel it in my sternum as if there's something like tick, 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 hitting you and I mean we know so little about them like what are they picking up about me what are they learning about me what can they see I believe that they can see what energy I bring there what desire I bring into the water so I was <laughs> just say the whole hanging there in the water thinking, I love you, I love you, you're amazing, you're beautiful, you're very large. I love you, I love you, you're amazing, you're beautiful. Please don't swim over me. You know, just trying to give them that that feeling that they know I'm here to share space with you. I'm not here to conquer you. It's something about the ocean that, you know, from early explorers that we felt we need to conquer it. We don't. It's unbelievably gentle. We need to hold it. We need to treasure it. It might be large. But not all large things are strong. <laughs> it's not. It needs us to treat it as if it's very small and very fragile, even though it has the greatest, most phenomenal creatures in it. So I got scanned by these sperm whales. And um, somehow the one adult deemed me worthy <laughs> of meeting her baby. And the photographer Jean-Marie I work with, we started calling it the crazy baby because the baby would come speeding out of the pod. And I don't know whether it didn't really know what it was doing or if the mommy told it, you know, you can go explore, it's safe. But it swam right into us and it kept swimming right into us and almost like nuzzling us. And I mean, I say baby, but I mean, it's much larger than me. A baby sperm whale is still a large amount of, I guess, blubber and sperm. <laughs> and... If I can encourage you to do anything, it's to answer that little seal inside of you and to remember that your love story also starts in water and started in water and with a swimmer and to step back into it because there is so much to see and we are so connected to it. We cannot see ourselves as apart from it. We can't afford to. There's no time. We need to be protecting it. But also because for ourselves, not just for the ocean, you need to get back into water not just for the sake of the ocean, for your sake. There's a wholeness in total submersion that is that we need, I think, to be truly happy. So that's what I want to leave you with is, I don't know if you can see me at the top. Yeah. It's a reminder that how small we are and how powerful we are in our smallness. 
and that we are, even though we are that small, we are big enough to hold that whole blue in our hands and treasure it.